Kings, chapter 19, verse 8 to 19. And we're continuing in the Gospel Project series, uh, Kings and Prophets, Prophets and, Prophets and Kings. We're looking into the lives of the divided kingdom and uh, how the people of God responded to who God was. And today's scripture is of the story of Hezekiah, um, Hezekiah King Hezekiah. We'll read from a portion of his uh, story and found in chapter 19, verse 8 to 19. And uh, let's read responsively as we usually do. So this is the word of God. The Rapsheke returned and found the king of Assyria fighting, fighting against Libna. For he heard that the king had left Lachish. Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you by promising the, that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Have the gods of the nations delivered them, the nations that my fathers destroyed, Gozan, Haran, Rezeph, and the people of Eden, who are in Telazar? Where is the king of heaven, the king of Arpen, the king of the city of Sebar, the king of Nina, or the king of Nina? Hezekiah received a letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, God of Israel, and throne of God of Israel, you are the God, you alone, all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. And together, and have cast their God into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hand, wood and stone. Therefore, they were destroyed. Amen. This is the word of God. Uh, last year, when I was on a mission trip, more of a vision trip, to see the lay of the land spiritually um, on the other side of the globe, um, I was intimidated, really. Whenever you go to a country where, you know, proselytizing, you know, uh, sharing your faith is illegal, it is always a little bit intimidating. And it was like that in that country. Because uh, we were able to uh, look around and uh, see the spiritual condition with some missionaries. But we were forbidden to speak to any local Christian leaders uh, for a fear that uh, they might get you know, some kind of punishment for having contact with foreign missionary or foreign people. In general, so uh, I felt like being like a spy, <laughs> and uh, so wherever wherever you went, you had to go in twos or three, a group of two or three, not a big group, so you won't be so conspicuous. Uh, there was this building that we were entering with the missionaries, and uh, he gave us some in instructions. He says, uh, when you go into the lobby, uh, just walk straight, don't look around, don't talk to each other, say nothing and then walk to the elevator, and on a certain floor, we're going to go to this room, and then we can speak. Sounded easy, right? But it was scary. <laughs> I'd never done anything illegal intentionally, right? And I felt like, you know, a, 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 a spy, really, um, in a, like a James Bond movie. <laughs> Not that much, but, you know, uh, it was scary and uh, frightening, because I was afraid that if I do something wrong, or I usually do, do something wrong, that um, the missionaries or the local people may get punishment or harmed. So uh, I was um, afraid. I was very careful. And everywhere we went after that time, you know, everywhere, we didn't get to talk with local people, but everywhere we stepped on, we prayed for the land, and we prayed fervently in tears for the people of the land. 
when where the government is is has a grip on the country and where there is no religious little religious freedom and missionaries are being kicked out it is difficult to um, you know to express your faith and truly praise the God that we love so much and I felt like this truly is a spiritual battle I want to ask you brothers and sisters is a spiritual battle only over there on the other side of the globe where religious liberty is not as abundant as here in the States? Is there no spiritual battle here on U.S. soil because we have religious freedom, it's a free country, you know, the freest country in the world? In fact, there are spiritual battles every day, uh, like the air we breathe, we are attacked in every way. And what is a spiritual attack? What is spiritual warfare? Any satanic or demonic attack against God or against his people is spiritual warfare. And uh, we have a different sort of uh, spiritual attack, don't we? Whether, are we, we? whether we're tempted by sin, the desire of the flesh, desire of the eyes, the pride of life. Or it could be another kind of attack when we are frightened. Satan intimidates us by our surroundings. The uncertainty of our future the, uh, the things that we cannot handle and control. We make us, that those things make us afraid. Whether it's uh, attraction to sin, temptation of sin, whether it's a terror tactic spiritually, they're all spiritual attacks by the enemy. The one common thing, the purpose of spiritual attack by the enemy is actually one. It is to separate us from the God we love. Even though we are Christians, if you have uh, confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, Lord and Savior, the one, one purpose of Satan is to, to detach us from loving God and put something in there uh, except for, uh, aside from God, some idol in our lives so that we will not experience and enjoy the fruit of being a child of God. Therefore, we must understand and know what is our response against spiritual, uh, great spiritual threats. I'm talking about everyday, you know, temptation here and there, but there are times in our lives when we are greatly threatened, we are greatly attacked by the enemy. What is our response against those powers? You might be going through such a time, or you will go through such a time, a great spiritual threat. That's the question we want to ask and answer this morning. What is our response. How do we respond? How do we stand against the spiritual threats, great spiritual threats? And we look at today the story of Hezekiah, a king who was threatened spiritually, threatened by the enemy of God. Our story starts in chapter 18, in fact, not 19. And uh, something uh, traumatic had happened in chapter 18. You see, Hezekiah was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. If you recall from last time how Isaiah prophet, the prophet Isaiah was, it was called by God after the death of King Uzziah. Uzziah, uh, Ahaz, and then King Hezekiah, and then King Manasseh. So he served many kings throughout the years. And uh, in his career, you know, he was serving Hezekiah. And it was in the early reign of Hezekiah that Hezekiah witnessed something that's truly unbelievable and traumatic. Because uh, the northern kingdom, neighboring kingdom, King uh, Hoshea, he was surrounded by the enemy country, uh, Assyria. In fact, the Assyrians came with uh, tens of thousands of horses and chariots. They had these, these weapons of war, these battering, battering rams to destroy the, the city and the siege. They had a siege on the city of Samaria, the capital city of northern kingdom. Uh, do you have the map, actually? And uh, for three years, the kingdom of the uh, capital of Samaria was sieged by this, this awesome power, this military might of uh, Syria. And uh, to everybody's surprise, this, uh, see, this siege was successful, and the uh, city fell. In fact, they took all the, uh, the, the prisoners of war and scattered them all over the Mesopotamian near ancient world. As you can see, the blue, is it the blue? Uh, the purple, uh, the purple arrows indicate that it's scattering like sand all over, all across that uh, near eastern uh, place, that area, the broad region. 
And such a tragedy, even today, we call those people the lost ten tribes of Israel. They were lost, gone forever. And now, Hezekiah was reigning in the southern kingdom, and he's watching this. He's watching the Assyrians come down, and they are, they're targeted on him. He's in the crosshairs. Now they're marching toward Jerusalem. They had already defeated the fortified cities of Lachish, which is the, are the border cities of southern Judah. And now they're at the footsteps uh, of Jerusalem. And now we finally get the name of the general who is leading this campaign down to Jerusalem. And his name is Rapsake. We don't know if that Rapsake is actually a name or a title of the Assyrian you know, a military order. But regardless, he came with a big threat. And uh, it was enough to intimidate King Hezekiah. What was the threat? The threat was, he was speaking in Hebrew. The people of the, lang the language of the people, so that everybody can understand. Rapsake was probably fluent in both uh, uh, Assyrian and uh, Hebrew. He said, surrender. Don't think that King Hezekiah can save you. He's talking to the Jerusalem people. Uh, we will transport you over to another land, and you will enjoy grapes, you will enjoy pomegranates and figs, and you will have a prosperous life if you submit to the king of Assyria. So, the people of Jerusalem, in fact, Hezekiah was threatened. Imagine if your family member, your son, daughter, or your spouse, was threatened by somebody, uh, some, you know, uh, intruder, was, they, they, they threatened your, your family. What would you do? Wouldn't you call 911, call the police, and take care of the situation? You are violated, and you're threatened, you're scared, so you call 911. But who would Hezekiah call? This army came with all these wars of weapon and, and tens of thousands of men on horses and they're mocking the people of Jerusalem. They're mocking God. Who is he going to call at this time? So Hezekiah was scared enough. And so we find in verse 1 of chapter 19, he tears his clothes, covers himself in sackcloth, it says. He's destroyed. He's undone. And he maybe has this question against, uh, uh, for God. God, I wasn't like the other kings because you know that I had reformed this country. I got rid of all the idols. I tried to live as your way, as your word says. I tried to restore our country to our original forefathers you know, who worship God, who serve God. And God, this threat, it was devastating. It was truly heartbreaking. And so he tears his clothes, gets in sackcloth, and he goes in the temple of God to pray. But on the way he asks, he tells a messenger to talk to Isaiah, the prophet. And he says in verse 4, please pray for us. He was like the, you know, the chaplain, the priest for the nation. Isaiah was. And uh, amazingly, God answered that prayer right away. Verse 6 and 7. Isaiah sends the message of God to King Hezekiah. And basically the message was, do not fear the Assyrians. Do not fear the Assyrians. And this is what's going to happen. King of Assyria will hear a certain message, will hear a uh, rumor, will go back to his own kingdom, his own land, and he will be assassinated. He will be spared. So what was God saying? Oh, King, uh, the, uh, the king of Assyria, who you're so afraid of right now, he's just another king who goes down the list of lines of kings, and he's assassinated by, by one of his uh, officials, and his son will be king. And so this was a, the prophecy, this was the promise of salvation that God was guaranteeing for Hezekiah. If you heard a message like that as the king, how would you respond? I bet you would be overjoyed, right? Because you are a God-fearing king, and you pray to God. And, and uh, he had confidence in what uh, God had said, especially none other than Isaiah was the prophet that told him the word of God. Every time Isaiah was speaking on behalf of God throughout even his forefathers, his uh, father, and, and so he knew, he trusted in Isaiah, and it was Isaiah who said, 
who told him the word of God that they will be spared and the king of Assyria who is such a big threat, such a you know, humongous uh, spiritual attack right now, he'll be just one of those kings, goes down the list, to be assassinated. And to this word, Hezekiah would have said, loud voice, Amen. You know, let, it, let God's will be done. Brothers and sisters, we learn an important principle here. No matter how difficult, how challenging, how fierce the spiritual battle in your situations might be, in the midst of that, when we hear a promise of God, when we know the ultimate score, the ultimate score will be uh, to our victory, we can be assured and we can be even at peace in the midst of this turmoil. When we are threatened and dismayed by a very difficult situation, and when we have something wrong with our health, something's, something's critically wrong with our financial situations, and uh, we are faced with a tremendous spiritual attack in some way, you know, what, we, what do we do? We pray. What do we do? We, we yearn for a word of God. Maybe on a Sunday like this, you're wondering, God, would you tell me something this morning through your worship? You're searching for God's answer. And when you do receive it through a sermon, when you do receive it through a, your quiet time as you read your word of God, when you do receive it through a prayer, what is that, it's, what is that like? It's like a, a drop of honey from heaven. It's something that's satisfying, something that gives you confidence and assurance. It's not just feel-good message. It is the Word of God. God, the very Word that created heaven and earth. That God tells me something. That gives me tremendous confidence and faith to face any kind of adversity that we might have in our lives. What is the promise of God that God has given you and I in all of our daily struggles? We've read to the end of the book of the Word of God and we know the ultimate victory is to us. Because Jesus Christ has, again, he died and resurrected, which means that he conquered death. Is anybody going through a difficulty that's greater than death? You wouldn't be here then, right? Nothing is greater than the pain of death in our lives. And, and Jesus who has captured and defeated death, and last, uh, last uh, two weeks ago, we talked about Isaiah 53, that Jesus, like a war general, victorious general, he comes back with the spoils and gives it out, hands it out to all his people. He handed out eternal life to us. Resurrection, he promised that to us. So when we are reminded of the ultimate victory in Christ, ultimate promise that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, we feel confident. We say, this will pass too. This spiritual attack this burden will also be one of those kings, assassinated kings. It might be a great threat to us right now. It might seem that way and might be fearful before our eyes. But in the bigger picture of God, as we trust the ultimate victory in Christ, found in Christ, we can stand against the attack. Even kids know this fact, right? When there's a prize when there's the ultimate victory promised for them, they can persevere. When my, when my son was smaller and little, I mean younger, um, you know, um, we made a little deal with him. And he said, I said, we told him, if you do not drink soda, like Coke, for a year, we'll give you $50, right? You gotta understand, $50 might not be that much to you right now, but for a kid who's young, who was receiving 25 cents per chore, Getting $50 is like a million dollars, you know? And uh, we were surprised. We thought, you know, he's not going to be able to finish this. But what was, was, was we wrong? <laughs> he was so adamant. He was so fixed to getting that $50, that treasure in his life, you know, fortune, that he actually didn't drink one sip of, of soda the entire year. And he does drink a little bit right now, but, uh, you know, he, that habit kind of stuck with him. And he's really good at it because he knows there's a prize. The ultimate victory is his. $50 is his. And he can persevere the temptation of, of sugar or water, right? For us people of God, God has promised us ultimate victory in Jesus Christ. As we see that amazing gift, that life, every, anything we encounter today, any threat of the enemy, it's nothing. It pales in compared to the glory 
that is promised to us. In fact, did you know that Jesus also, when he was fearing, facing the most difficult time of his life on this earth, that uh, he promised us peace? In John 16, 33, let's read this verse together on the screen. Let's ready, read together. Ready, go. I have said these things to you, that in me you have peace. In the world you will, will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus had tremendous peace, enough peace to spare to us, saying that it was before the cross, right? <laughs> this was the night of the, before the night of crucifixion. And uh, he says, you know, I have overcome the world already in my Father, and I give you my peace. You will have, you will face tribulation, you will face spiritual attack in your life, but take heart, I give you this peace. When we trust in the ultimate victory in Christ, we can shout with Paul, in fact, saying, Death, where is your sting? Amen. We can shout with him and say, If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? Even angels, no demons can ever stand against the children of God. When we are reminded of the ultimate victory over death that Jesus Christ has given us, that eternal life is ours, we are heirs of the heavenly kingdom, there's no difficulty, no mountain, no valley to high or deep that can uh, destroy or discourage us. This is the first principle as we focus our eyes on the ultimate prize, the ultimate victory, we can Overcome. We can stand against the daily struggles, the daily attacks today. Well, our story does not end there, right? Because uh, surprisingly, just like Isaiah said, something happens. Uh, Rapsake, he hears that his boss, who was in Lachish, the king of Assyria, his name is Sennacherib. Sennacherib he was engaged in another battle, so they were moving the army. They were moving his men. So Rapsake also followed his lord, his master king. But uh, not before sending this message to Hezekiah. And this, this message that Hezekiah received was powerful enough to instill deep terror and fear like never before into the heart of Hezekiah and his people. Because... Uh, Rapsake delivered, uh, hand-delivered a message, a letter from king of Assyria, Sennacherib II, male to Hezekiah. In verses 10 to 13, we find what the content of this letter was. In short, the king of Assyria was saying, Hezekiah, don't deceive yourself. Don't be deceived. And think, and think uh, that your God can deliver you from my threat. And he states the facts, the difficult names that you've read this morning. The kings, where are they of all the nations? The gods that they serve, where are they? They have all been destroyed, wiped off the, planet, the face of the planet. And Hezekiah could not deny the actuality, the factualness of this letter. And uh, Assyria was, King of Assyria was basically saying that you will enjoy the same fate you will have the same fate unless you surrender. So don't be so cozy. I'm going to come back. I'm going to destroy the city and I'm going to destroy your people. When Hezekiah received this letter, a mail to his name, uh, the, the tremendous pressure would have been amazing. Imagine if your company that you work for received a letter from the IRS saying that you know, your, country, your company violated something and you have this heavy penalty on your company, and as an employee, you might be um, concerned. You know, do we have enough money to cover this, and do we need to change something in our practice that we do that uh, we've done an error? And so you're concerned. But then a few days later, you receive a letter from IRS in your name, you know, your first name and your last name, saying that you have violated something and you owe the IRS uh, this big penalty. How would you respond? Would you be just a little bit concerned? Oh, I'm concerned I got this letter. No, you'd be desperate. You'd try to find help, counsel from people, wisdom. And wouldn't you go down to, would you go come to the sanctuary to pray on your face to God? God, 
There's no way I could take care of this. This is just too much. This is overwhelming. Wouldn't be, would you be more desperate? And that's what Hezekiah, that's why Hezekiah responded the way that he did. We saw this morning. It wasn't just anxiety in his heart. It was, he was, he felt, was feeling that he was undone. There is no hope for him. He tore his clothes. He, wore in sack, he was wearing sackcloth. And he was going to God. And he was very desperate. What did he do? As we read this morning, he spreads out the, the scroll, the letter that he received from uh, King Sennacherib. And uh, he prays to God in verse 16. He says, uh, I'll read from the New in English translation. Pay attention, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and observe. Listen to the message of Sennacherib sent and how he taunts the living God. What is Hezekiah doing? He's making it personal to God. God, my name is on here. The threat is against me and my people. But God, you and I know that he is making threats against you. Against the living God. Another important lesson that we learn here in times of great crisis is that we need to be able to be honest before God when we pray. Remember Hezekiah said amen, he was hopeful and he was faithful, he was confident in God. But after this letter, it all faded away. It was filled with fear. Maybe like us, you know, you say amen, you know, Jesus is my Lord and Savior this Sunday and you praise God, oh happy day, we, we praise our Lord on Sunday. But as Monday comes, Tuesday comes, the weekdays come, and you are faced with that enemy again, reality, each day. And your mind goes blank as you're uh, con confronted with this reality, this threat that's really overwhelming you. What can you do? How can you stand against the threats, the spiritual threats in your life? We can stand against God, against these things, like Hezekiah. We can be, we need to be honest in our prayers. Not those flowery, you know, uh, written down, you know, amazing prayers that you do. Those prayers are needed, you know, as a co corporate prayer. But in a time of desperation, we pray for God's help like never before. In fact, I think the person that did this, this is very well was the King David. King David's prayer was very down to earth. In Psalm 34.1, he says this, O Lord, fight those who fight with me. Attack those who attack me. This was a, a, a very, you know, um, down-to-earth prayer. And it was, he was saying that, God, you are being attacked. It's not just about me. I am a person of God. You have assigned me to this task. And if I'm being attacked, it's about you. So Lord, fight those who fight uh, fight, fight those who fight me. Attack those who attack me. What can we do in a time of crisis? We need to present the facts before God like Hezekiah did. We need to be able to be honest before God. And tell him that this is really an attack. And it is overwhelming for us. I believe another person of God that did this well as an example was uh, Sister Hannah. You know, Hannah in the Bible. Hannah, as you know, was barren, couldn't have children. And uh, she, she cried her heart out because of this situation. For many years, Elkanah, her husband, and his other wife, his other wife, Panina, they, they had a lot of children, right? And whenever the time of uh, harvest came, and whenever the time of uh, the sacrifice came, they would... Hannah would see this family with many children laughing and enjoying and, you know, enjoying the family that God had given them. And Panina, being who was the, the little bit mean one, would come to Hannah and remind her that she was barren. She was rubbing in the salt, so to speak, in the wounds of her heart, this, uh, this hurt that she has of being barren. What did Hannah do? Hannah took it up to the Lord, right? And uh, she prayed so fervently, so desperately before the priest Eli that he thought she was drunk. And woman, stop your drink, stop your wine. She was mistaken. Jesus was also very honest in his prayer. He 
presented the facts before God, his heart before God. Remember, again, his darkest hour was the night before he was captured. And on the Mount of Olives, he prays to God, God, if this, this is your will, please remove this cup away from me. Although Jesus was fully God, he was fully human. And he was afraid. We can read from the scripture that he was afraid to take the cup of the cross that God was giving him. When we are in, um, uh, against tremendous threats, spiritual attack, we need to be able to present the facts, present our hearts, just pour out our hearts before our Lord. When we do that, we, can, we don't have to complain to others. We don't have to feel bad about our situation as we confess, as we appeal our situation to our Lord. And that was one way that Hezekiah was able to withstand this uh, tremendous, this amazing situation. But lastly, I want you to notice the last part that Hez of Hezekiah's prayer. How did Hezekiah withstand this tremendous threat in his life? He prayed for the glory of God's name. Going back to verse 19, it says, Now, O Lord our God, rescue us from his power. He prayed, he, don't mistake, he prayed for rescue, he prayed for salvation, and look at the reason why. So that all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you, God, Lord, are the only living God. I slipped in that word, living. He was looking at the other side. God, since this Sennacherib, this guy who wrote this letter, says he destroyed all the kingdoms, all the other false gods, they, yes, they're false gods, if you punish him, if you defeat this guy, if you save me and show that you are the God, all the nations will know that you are the true living God. Would you, God, do this for your name's sake, for your glory's sake? Not just for me, but this is all about you, God. And that was the prayer of Hezekiah. In the heart of the prayer of Hezekiah was the uh, lifting up of God's honor and God's glory. He truly wanted God to be lifted up. Throughout the Bible, the one thing we constant, constantly see is God fighting for his own name's sake. Even in the Ten Commandments, the Third Commandment says, not take the Lord's name in vain. He was, he's, he was always serious about his name. He, in fact, he was very careful, reserved, in even revealing his name to Moses. God is very particular. He cares much for the fame of his name. And so when Hezekiah was praying for your namesake, God, this is about you, God had to answer. Let's go back to Jesus. With Jesus, uh, again, his greatest spiritual attack was the cross. It was the time of the crucifixion. He, I want you to make, make you aware that he prayed for one thing among many. He prayed for the glory of God. Uh, let's read together one verse. Uh, John 17, verse 1. The first verse of this, uh, this priestly prayer of Jesus that he prayed the last before he was captured. Let's read it together. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. In the most darkest hour. In fact, when Satan was about to devour him, Commit him to death. The hour has come. Glorify me, even in the cross. Glorify me means resurrection in the third day. So that the Son may glorify you. Would you do this? Would you save me and glorify me for your glory's sake? For your will to be done on this earth. For all your children to receive the salvation that you have planned all along. Would you be glorified and glorify me? to do that. Even Jesus prayed this amazing prayer for us that God would be glorified through Jesus' death and resurrection. In the time of desperate need and, and difficulties in our lives, we need to pray for SOS, you know, Lord, save us. But we must not forget the reason that we, the basis for which we can make that claim, that make that request. We need to pray for the glory of God. God, would you save me so that this would be glorifying of your name. This would glorify you. People know that I'm a Christian 
and your name is at stake here. At stake here. God, would you do this for your name's sake? This is the way that the Bible teaches us how to pray. Because when we exalt the groom, Jesus Christ, Jesus will exalt his bride, his bride, and she will be glorified as we glorify him. This is the faith that we seek, and this is the desperate and the great prayer that we need to practice. As I close, I want to mention this. I'm so thankful for many of the Christian corporations in the U.S. Um, and I may mentioned these companies a couple of times before. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the company Hobby Lobby, and they are, they are Christian from the founding principles, and uh, you know, they support a lot of Christian ministry, and they're doing very well in the South. <laughs> and also, you've uh, you probably heard of uh, In-N-Out hamburgers, maybe, <laughs> here in California. And uh, I don't know about the current situation, but you know, they have these Bible verses. The founder was obviously wanting to, um, they, they wanted to promote Christian values. And the uh, last company I want to mention is Chick-fil-A. You know, I didn't receive anything from them. You know, it's not a commercial. Uh, I just love them because they have this philosophy up front on their billboards. What, is, what does it say? It says, closed on Sunday. You might not think much of that, but it is a founding principle that uh, S. Truett Cathy was uh, the founder, the CEO, who passed away a couple of years ago. He had it from the, first, from the beginning. Because he was saying, on this Lord's day, we will not do business. Any other day, we will serve the most delicious chicken sandwich to you. But on this Lord's day, we honor the Lord. You know, my family visited Atlanta, the headquarters, over the summer, as some of you know. And I walked into, we, they, they had this, you know, backstage tour kind of thing. And uh, we walked into the CEO, CEO, you know, Kathy's, true Kathy's room. And uh, I thought it was a pastor's office, really, <laughs> you know. It was as if, you know, he just you know, left yesterday. He's going to come back. To, it looked like that. I mean, it's so real. Everything was just as it was. And in the middle of it was, of course, the cow. <laughs> but uh, in front of that cow was uh, a Bible open to Proverbs chapter 22. And it's a reflection of how he did business. In this world of, of capitalism and you know, uh, a competition and fierce battle, a lot of attacks. He put the word of God at the forefront of his, mini of his uh, company. And today, God blessed him so much to be number three of the fast food industry in the whole U.S. after McDonald's and Starbucks, I believe. And indeed, they are attacked all the time. They're being boycotted all over the country because of their Christian values, family values. But stay, God, still, God is protecting them and they are able to lead on. Brothers and sisters, I'm not here to promote Chick-fil-A, chicken sandwich at, at, at all. But I am here to promote what scripture says. When we exalt the Lord, if we exalt his promise in, in our lives, God will exalt you. God will hold you tight to stand against his enemy, the enemies. Because who is greater than God? No one is greater than God. No one can st snatch us out of his hands. So brothers and sisters, let us remember the prayer of Hezekiah, this, this desperate prayer of salvation to be able to pray for the glory of God's name's sake and to be able to present the facts before God and also trusting in the ultimate victory of Jesus Christ. And as we do, no enemy is greater than us. Let's pray.